of the companies that define my childhood, none stand out more than Hasbro, and Takara Tomy by proxy. I never got into most of their series, but I did get into Transformers, my all-time favourite franchise ever. It wasn't alone amongst my favourite things, I've always had Godzilla as well, and just a general fascination with non-avian dinosaurs that has continued to this day. So I thought, how could I celebrate Hasbro history? I know, I love Transformers. That has a new animated film coming out this year, allegedly, and also it's the 40th anniversary, so why don't I go through all their previous animated films? I'm already a huge Transformers fan, but there's only so many animated Transformers films. I know, I'll go through all Hasbro animated films. Uh, going through everything, including their other flagship franchise, My Little Pony, who combined make up over half of the total films animated by Hasbro. So why not? We have to set some ground rules though. I'm only including theatrical films, directed DVD films, and TV films. What I mean by this is that I'm not including any TV specials that aren't listed as being television films on Wikipedia. I'm also not including any compilation films, like the Inhumanoids or Gem and the Hologram movies, which is really just a bunch of episodes slapped together. I'm also not including the GoBots or Pound Puppies movie, as while they are technically Hasbro, that is only because they were later bought out by Hasbro. They originally were Tonka films, and that cuts the films down to a nice and neat 20 odd. It's nearly 30 actually. Including some that are technically Takara Tomy, but they're essentially synonymous with Hasbro, so whatever. I'm including all subsidiaries of Hasbro, but only films made after they became subsidiaries of Hasbro. And I'm not counting Scourge of Worlds, that is an interactive movie and I don't think it really fits. Let's go, there's a lot of movies, especially ponies, to talk about, so let's begin. Now again, we're not including TV specials, which there are a few of, and the, I'll show you one right now. R and I, what news have you received from Earth? Optimus, there's some ginormous freaky looking plan on its way to Cybertron! What? Has word been sent on a solution? I got a message from Shockwave at the Decepticon High Command! Shockwave? Optimus Prime, in these dire straits we require aid. A titanic planetoid self-identifying under the name Unicron has begun a purge across the cosmos. We only know of one weakness. Tell us, Shockwave. We require G-Fuel, the sponsor of this audio-visual message. Got it, I... What? Aren't I? Prepare a shipment of... Prime? What the lubricant is G-Fuel gonna do? You, you don't know? No, I mighty well don't. G-Fuel is an all-in-one plant-based energy formula created by the human race. I do not see how it can help, Prime. I'm not entirely sure myself of all its benefits. Perhaps you'd be best to communicate with one of the humans. Duke? Hey guys, I'm Duke, a real American hero. You sound Australian. Nobody asked you. G-Fuel is a miracle of fine American science, containing zero calories, sugar, or carbohydrate. All you told me is what it don't got. Nobody ever got any tail pops kicked doing nothing. Well, I'll be. You have quite the lack of patience. Who in the pit are you? You think just because I'm not in any movie in this ranking outside of a background detail in the credits means I can't cameo? Let me give you a tidbit. G-Fuel is available both in can and in tubs. Happy? Again, I don't see how- I'm Action Man. Thank you, Action Man! Anyway- What might surprise you is that despite lacking sugar, G-Fuel is just as sweet and delicious as anything else in Candyland, even licorice! What, really? That's correct. G-Fuel only lacks sugar, not taste. Your only concern is that it contains a decent amount of caffeine. Make sure you don't let any kids under the age of 18 drink it, and be responsible if you choose to as well. Or perhaps purchase a zero caffeine range. I ain't drinking it, I- Friendship is G-Fuel! G-Fuel is a real American hero. Okay, but- I'm Action Man. Thank you, Action Man, I get the idea. Where is this uh, G-Fuel? Oh, I know this. If you head to the link in the description and use code BLOODRIKE, you can purchase G-Fuel for yourself and get 20% off your order. I'm on it, Prime! I'll do this to support the channel, along with liking and subscribing and leaving a comment to help drive engagement! Um... I'm not entirely sure how to react to this. Oh dear, this is a bad time to bring up that this is a three-way call. Hey? This is a real-time moment. Huh? I'm Action Man. Thank, Thank you, Action, Action Man. It's the biggest piece of dog sh- Inarguably the worst thing I've seen all year so far. 
Action Man X Missions is just a later film we'll see, G.I. Joe Valor vs. Venom, but infinitely worse. In that it is literally the exact same movie, the exact same intro sequence as in literally the stock footage from that movie, a scene of the army guys dealing with a bear full of tranks in a zoo, the main boss guy being kidnapped by the villains and then they shoot down a satellite, the villain using the DNA of animals to envenomate the world to make them mind controlled hybrids he can command with his staff, then using that and magnetic fields to turn the kidnapped hero into a super mega one of them who he struggles to control in front of the main protagonist. The heroes return with a toxic infected guy they used to make an antidote. Someone says verbatim, there is no door and then break through a door with their hand while the main hero is next to them. Where they retrieve their weapons, then find out their breakout was planned and the villain taunts them on a monitor before setting up an explosive sequence that wipes out their Antarctic base. The heroes find their new proper base around South America and where they have the exact same temple and railgun set up. Ready to go in 10 minutes, but then the heroes fly in and airdrop the cure on people. But it doesn't work on the former hero mutate who rebels and slaps up the main villain and the main heroes while he's at it, while breaking the staff meant to control him. Then three guys toss him into the railgun where they use magnetic fields and they appeal to his good nature to turn him back to normal. Verbatim the same movie, but worse. Because any of the few unironically good parts of that film were taken out, the voice adding is significantly worse, with the only good performances being Dr. Gangrene and kind of no face, and far less interesting characters and even plot points. The movie is boring, and ugly, and derivative of another film that came out just the year prior, with exactly the same plot, but worse. No Face and Gangrene are the only parts of this movie worth watching, as they're pretty fun. And even then, it's only because later on in the film, No Face becomes in even more pathetic and whimpering, and that's really funny. But otherwise, it's a waste of time and only a test of patience. Who in the green hell are you? My Little Pony Twinkle Wish Adventure is the only film present in the Generation 3.5 continuity. And thank fucking god, because if I had to watch another one of these, I would end myself. Twinkle Wish Adventure is what happens if you try to make a movie about nothing. They literally took my girl Minty out of this generation. What? And even beyond that, none of these characters are the same as they were from the previous installments. Beyond Pinkie Pie lacking pink, they are all pretty well devoid of identity. Each pony amounts to a toy to be sold, which I know should be the norm for all the films in this ranking, but at least characters like Rainbow Dash and Rodimus Prime have personality traits to apply to the character beyond just toy advertisement. The plot of this movie is so slapdash. It feels like it'll be about how one pony got left out, but oh okay, never mind, they made up and she won. Okay, so the film is about stopping this wish and star from waking up, right? Oh, okay, no, it's awake and it's been kidnapped. Okay, so most of the film is about getting it back, right? Alright, sure. They find the horrific thing and it's kidnapper. They then sing with her, and then when she tells them to fuck off, they don't even consider fighting, they just let her keep the kidnapped slave. Then when the kidnapper comes back, she gets rewarded for it with all her friends. What a lovely message. If you kidnap someone and give them back, you will get a reward as you deserve and everyone will be friends with you. This movie isn't anything, it's nothing, I can barely criticize it because it's a big fat bowl of nothing soup. If you could take the thin air that is directly next to you right now and turn that into a movie, you would get Twinkle Wish Adventure. But what you made would probably still have better animation. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? Action Man X Missions Code Gangrene is by far the worst looking thing on this list. I hazard to even call it a movie. It looks like a Studio Brinquedo rejected animatic that someone polished up with the moist sticky end of used toilet paper. I know it's low budget, but holy crap, plenty of films on this list are low budget and they all look better. Not just that, but it's a bad story and it's an awful cast again. I hate the Action Man cast. Gangrene and No Face are the only things that save it, and... I guess like X-Man whatever his face is is fine sometimes too. And there's an Aussie in this cast and I hate him. This film is every bit as bad as the previous X-Missions, but it has a few saving graces. That being, it has the most hilariously over the top moments in the trilogy, and it's actually got its own original story unlike X-Missions. Still, I'd rather eat my own forearm than watch this again. I was hoping as a Mexico exclusive movie that it would not have subtitles so I could skip it, but fuck me I guess. Double in many ways, My Little Pony The Runaway Rainbow is not too different from his prior Generation 3 My Little Pony films. They're all very child-friendly, no-edge, no-conflict movies that were just, just a bunch of whatever happens. But the difference here is that Runaway Rainbow focuses on the character of Rarity, and anyone who hates Friendship is Magic Rarity should probably be thankful that they didn't get this one instead. Runaway Rainbow is literally a movie where we learn that Rarity needs to make a rainbow, but she runs away or some shit and then has to get back, only for us to find out the whole time there was no conflict because she just weighed around her magic wand when it was time to, using a spell that she did not forget how to do and didn't need help with. There'd be no problem. Literally the whole time if she just stayed there and waved around her magic wand, she already knew how to do it and it was not a problem. I'll at least give the movie props of actually having a conflict, which not all the Generation 3 My Little Pony films have. But they're also not ranked yet, so... You can tell that I like those better by knowing they exist. 
And see, at least a film like Princess Promenade focused on the character I don't dislike, or in her interactions with everyone. Runaway Rainbow has basically no fun character interactions beyond a bit with Minty and Pinkie Pie because Minty is the best in this generation. There's no fun, there's no jokes I like, there's a bunch of rarity ruining everything for everyone and acting like she has no idea what to do when she's worried when literally she knows everything she has to do. There's no fun to be had, there's no jokes I like, there's a bunch of rarity ruining everything for everyone and acting like she has no idea what to do when she's worried when she literally does. Then it fails because she's a dumb shit who did it too late instead of doing it when she knows she should have. And then the unicorns slap dicks together and save the rainbow. Woo! A movie that's barely worth watching because there's barely anything to watch. I'm so tough I even break Tonka toys. Built Tonka Tough is pretty damn accurate because this movie was a tough watch. With animation so bad it honestly rivals Action Man's, with them battling it out for worst animation between unfinished and unpolished 3D models with no life that move incredibly stiff, and ugly, overly flat, awkward 3D models with no life that move incredibly stiff. This movie is about Tonka Joe. Tonka Joe! Engaging in a race, but then, oh no, he's just too nice and bumps a bad guy to save him, and everyone thinks he's a bad sport now, and the kid that is his biggest fan abandons him and goes missing, and then they just find him. And Kathy Weslick giving so few shits that she just does her spike voice with no alterations whatsoever in the role of an AI chatbot tells him he's a fucking moron. Something which would be really satisfying as the kid gets verbally beat down if the only reason he wasn't a moron wasn't because nobody fucking explained to him that was what was going on for no reason. Then our hero saves the day and there's a fire in a big dramatic scene as everyone goes, there's no way that Action Man, sorry, Tonka Joe survived that. And then he survived it. What a fucking god-awful movie, an hour of pain and nothingness, with several scenes dedicated to the stock animation of his truck turning into a plane, which, fair play, that was so absurd I did get a hearty chuckle out of it the first time, but most of the movie is not bad enough to be funny and not good enough to be below average. It's not worth your time and I wish either of the other Tonkin movies counted for this ranking instead. Your life is nothing! You serve zero purpose. The fact that Candyland The Great Lollipop Adventure is not in the bottom five is embarrassing. Candyland is not a movie, it's an experience. An experience in meandering and suffering. There's nothing in this movie, just nothing. The protagonist is an annoying gingerbread man I hope would die. He's accomplished by the annoying Mr. Mint who is pretty much just an asshole that tries to ruin this kid's journey. And a little girl unfortunately named Lolly. Also a dog gum thing that's just annoying and trying too hard to be cute. They do nothing all movie, they kind of just walk a straight line with basically nothing getting in the way. They come across a river of chocolate and dog shit, they hug a big monster and they stop the villain. Now points to the villain, Lord Licorice, the prejudiced against villain voiced by Mark Oliver who is about the only person with a passable performance in this film. He has a fun enough villain song and all the best scenes are his, and he's also an idiot who lost because he got his foot stuck and forgot he could just bend over slightly to pop the wand into the hole. Oh and there's the big ending where, would you look at that, the protagonist didn't need to bring a gift, he WAS the gift! Because the real gift is all the people in the kingdom and shut the fuck up, this movie is nothing! Lights. Camera. Action 52. Oh. The only thing I give Action Man Robot Attack is that it's short and it ends soon. It's probably the least offensive of the trilogy, but only in that it's the most standard nothing. The dialogue is awful, the voice setting is atrocious, and... I just want to go again, the dialogue is some of the worst you'll ever hear straight up. And god, Action Man himself across all three films is the absolute most fucking lame hero. Comparing to the other heroes of big series on this list, you got Hot Rod, a young and brash kid who doesn't think things through. He learns to be a more responsible person due to the consequences of his actions, and comes into his own as someone who can really be a new leader who puts his mind to it as the mighty Rodimus Prime. Twilight Sparkle is a dork who wants to have a handle on everything, thrust into an impossible situation and struggling to maintain her calm as the rock that holds together the team. She learns to let her friends help with her stress so she can save the day and everyone else. You have Duke, a smart and confident army guy who has to suddenly take command of a situation he's never been in before using his machismo and raw chad energy, quick thinking to get back his commander and earn the right to use his gauntlet. Then you have Action Man, the guy who is due a fight. Just awful. Action Man is dead to me. I hate this trilogy and I hope to god the TV shows aren't this bad. <laughs> Peppa Pig and the Golden Boots was a theatrical release and that's the most interesting thing about it. The fact that of the theatrical films on this list, there is some from My Little Pony, one from Transformers, and two from Peppa Pig. 
Frankly, the fact that it racked above the dead bottom, and not even in the bottom five, is the funniest part of this experience. The 50 minute episode, uh, sorry, movie about Peppa Pig is literally just a duck steals her shoes and then speed blitzes everyone until old man pig scares her shitless. And then Peppa joins into a competition and cheats, allowing her to win and be rewarded in place of this elephant man who won fair and square, and this potato guy is just a bastard. If you had closed your eyes to not look at what I was showing on screen and just imagine everything in your head from my description, you would probably have a more hype experience than this film would give you. That said, this is a film for toddlers. It's a baby short that's only 15 minutes long, and unlike the last few films, at least this is short enough that it doesn't infuriate me and bore me. It's long enough for me to be sick of it right as it ends, so I can safely say that I watched it and gained nothing from my experience. How harsh can I be though? It is for like two year olds. <laughs> the most memorable part of Peppa Pig, my first cinema experience, is that the Queen of England steals a bus driver's bus, accompanied by the narration of, when the Queen tells you to do something, you have to do it, and then endangering a bunch of kids by jumping a bridge instead of patiently waiting. Oh, and live action Peppa. It's really hard to say anything about this that I didn't say for the previous one, because I can't even narrate what happens as it's an anthology film and I forgot basically everything. This film for babies doesn't deserve too much harsh criticism though, which is why it's not near the bottom. It's not offensively bad, nor is it too dreadfully boring. It's for an even younger demographic than everything else on this list, so it gets something of a pass. The Smooths! The first ever Hasbro animated film. It's suboptimal. My Little Pony the movie was only the third ever piece of My Little Pony content, back in the first generation and only after the two specials. As such, it's very different to what people might be used to. There's humans, there's no real distinction between pony types beyond some can fly and some can't, and the characters have less identity than an AI generated movie script. Genuinely, I think the only characters with a notable personality are the bad guys, who are the bad evil mom and her emotionally abused children, and then Lickety Split, the pony who is an annoying crybaby who decides to run away from home because people were a bit annoying to her one time, because she deliberately ruined a dance despite Spike telling her not to. Oh, and there's also the pony that's just depressed and has another pony there to abuse her. Oh, and of course there's the legendary Grundle King played by Danny DeVito, and ironically the best part of the movie. The movie's plot feels like it doesn't know what it's doing. It starts with just Lickety Split running away with Spike, then the ponies with no personality go looking for her, then these three random witches for whatever reason create the Smooze, who gets beaten up 37 minutes before the end of the film by the Rainbow of Light, and then they run around for a bit more and the Smooze comes back and then dies again. The Smooze seems to be what everyone loves about this movie, and you know what, yeah, the Smooze is hilariously stupid, I kinda love him a little too but he's not worth stomaching this whole film for, it's just really not worth it. I definitely prefer watching the previous specials over it. No one. Look, I didn't want to include this any more than you, but My Little Pony Rainbow Road Trip is an hour-long television special, meaning it's long enough to count, and it did screen in cinemas. Not that I could imagine sitting through this in a cinema, because if I didn't have Transformers figures and Lego sets and bits of cloth lying on the floor to fiddle with, I would have fallen asleep. Rainbow Road Trip takes an interesting concept, that being the main six have been brought to a town without color and need to figure out what caused it and how to reverse it, and promptly does it? Essentially, we have a film that's just the main six talk a bit, and then meander, and then bam, story over, they figured it out. Surprise, it was the power of friendship. That's... that's it. What can I say? This television film isn't even like an episode of the show. Because even at their most middling, episodes of Friendship is Magic have plot points, and story beats, and progression. This is just the main six dick around in a black and white town so the animation can be easier to make, and then they make some people talk and be friends again, and that's all resolved, and that's all, that's all, but it's the end, it's done. I don't even think the animation is that amazing. Like, yeah, the main six still look really good, but while they look like they're from a budgeted version of the 2017 movie, everything else looks like it's being done in the main show, but if they tried to alter the designs to look more like the movie, giving an uncanny feeling of disparity between everyone else in the main group. It's not awful, but it's notable to me. When the 40 minute specials for Equestria Girls have 20 less minutes in them but manage to tell more compelling stories with better emotional moments and development, that's really sad. Sunset's Backstage Pass and Forgotten Friendship both likely would have ranked number 3 and 4 in this ranking, by the way. Both things I would much rather talk about than Rainbow Road Trip. I wanted to step on me! Rainbow Road Trip is trying so hard to be the Princess Promenade, a film where nothing happens and that's the vibe. And the difference is that Princess Promenade is. moderately more fun. It's definitely nothing terribly special, but I don't know, it was okay. Now, I did watch this out of order amongst G3 My Little Pony, but I was able to pick up and play to the characters. Not just the ones I recognized in G4, like Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash, but even like Minty, Sunny, Daffy Daisy, and the protagonist Wisteria. That said, the only ones who really had that much of an identity in this movie were Wisteria and to an extent Daffy. That's one of my problems with this film. Similar to the first generation of My Little Pony, the designs are all very homogenized and similar, with little to stand out beyond color palette and tramp stamp. 
Unless you count me going, wait a minute, Komodo just sounds exactly like the great and powerful Trixie, I didn't really memorize most of the characters until past the 30 minute mark after half the film was done. And the film itself is a bit uneventful. You can summarize it as Wisteria and Pinkie Pie fall into a hole, find a dragon, Wisteria gets crowned princess, and then after realizing she doesn't like how a princess is supposed to act, decides to just be herself and make everyone a princess. In many ways, it's a story akin to if G4 did an episode where Applejack was crowned a princess and said no. I mean, that sounds like it'd be a fun episode. Applejack gets sent for for Spike as if she's something special, but she doesn't want it and comes up with a way to stop him from- WAIT NO 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 GO BACK THAT EPISODE up. Princess Promenade is a very simple film, but I like it. It's a generally fun enough if basic time. Wisteria is a fairly likable protagonist. Spike is about as unlikable as early friendship is magic Spike before he became not a little shit. And overall, it's hard to really give any sort of critique on a film about a bunch of horses setting up parade floats. It definitely has the energy of some of the mid-tier Land Before Time films where there's really no problem in need of solving, it's just kind of a half-baked slice of life. Also, Spike Alves and so is having a dominatrix king, what the fuck? Think I know a princess when she steps on me? You! God! That man is an imposter! Seize him immediately! What? No! He's the imposter! Yo, trackers, Cobra Commander! G.I. Joe Spy Troops might be the funniest 47 minutes you'll ever waste in your life. There is nothing to be gained here, and I adore every individual frame of this thing. This film had a budget of about 4 cents, and you might be thinking I should include the Equestria Girls 40 minute shorts here too because of this, but they were made for TV, this is made for DVD, that's the difference I guess, I'm sticking to it. Also I love those 40 minute specials, I just don't want to add even more to this list. Spy Troops then. What's not to love about this? The animation is horrible, it looks bad in every scene, and it's so fascinatingly bad in a way that's fun. I can't help but find every frame to be the funniest thing I've ever seen. And all four fight scenes dedicated to Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes are brilliant. The first fight feels like a 12 year old animation you'd find on YouTube that you spot in your recommended so you watch it and go, wow, that was 12 years ago. I remember this being better than it is. The voice acting is actually fine. It has some awful voices, but those are just voices that sound bad because they're going for something bad as opposed to the performance being bad. And Cobra Commander even sounds kind of great, the guy's having a lot of fun with it. I even spied Scott McNeil in this cast as Destro, which was amazing anytime he opened his mouth. I'm sorry, I just can't stop thinking about how stupid this was. The plot is bad, the pacing is bad, the writing is bad, and I think if it wasn't so bad, it wouldn't be so fun. I recommend this to everyone, genuinely, G.I. Joe fan or not. Because the only way I think someone could dislike this is if they dislike stupid fun nonsense bullshit. This is probably the funniest movie on the list, and I can't decide what's funnier between Among Us Cobra Commander, Storm Shadow swinging at nothing and that working, Storm Shadow and Snake Eyes flying all over the place away from each other, or the dramatic reveal of AGENT FACES! Dear Princess Celestia, I wanted to share my thoughts with you. Ahem. <clears throat> I didn't learn anything! Equestria Girls is a film that has a very interesting concept it does nothing with. As a movie, there's not a lot inherently bad about it, more so it's just lacking. The most notable thing missing in this film is really any major characterization for our alternate versions of the main six that differs from here are some of the traits they share with the horses, which is a damn shame. Because the idea of alternate versions of these characters who are not only human but also never had a Twilight Sparkle equivalent could have been so interesting. I honestly thought the lack of friendship they had with each other would have come down to how without a level head like Twilight to stop them and help them get through their troubles, and without that outlet to learn important lessons on friendship, that they simply were immature and couldn't maintain that friendship. I thought that would be what was going on. Which could have been an interesting cautionary tale meant to demonstrate why it's important for viewers to listen to the usually meaningful messages featured in the cartoon. But no. No. That's just not what happens. I also think it would have been cool to see how these characters' gimmicks differ without their supernatural abilities. Fluttershy can't talk to animals because humans don't do that, so how does her relationship with them differ? It doesn't. Applejack can't buck trees, because that's not a human job and she wouldn't be strong enough. So what does she do on her farm instead and how does that affect her? It doesn't. Rarity isn't a professional dressmaker, but maybe instead she's someone with a fashion obsession and is more scrappy than the original but less polished, because she's more akin to someone who tries to accomplish her dreams with limited resources. Nah, she's just barely in the film at all. About the only ones that work for me are Rainbow Dash, who instead of being a high flyer is a sports nut, which works, and Pinkie Pie, whose gimmick of basically being the exact same probably would have been a lot funnier if that didn't apply to everyone else. And about that breakup they have, yeah, that turns out to be because our main villain sent some texts. 
Like, not only is it kind of illogical because, what, was she stealing their phones and sending them messages while also psychically knowing exactly what events were going on in their lives and being able to time everything perfectly? Or did she just hear things and then send texts on her phone and the main six are idiots who assumed the random number was their friend? Do they not have caller ID? But also, it means that nobody really learns anything. They just learn that the villain is a bitch, and then they resolve their problems almost entirely off-screen. Rainbow Dash and Rarity barely get to appear in any regard before the conflict is resolved. Actually, I don't even remember if Rainbow Dash appears at all before it's resolved. I don't think she does! I think her first appearance is literally the second before they go and solve the problem. Such a missed opportunity. And speaking of missed opportunities, my favorite character in the entirety of My Little Pony is Sunset Shimmer. But holy hell did she have such a boring introduction in this film? As a villain, she is one note and not threatening. Partially because the whole film revolves around winning a fucking vote from the student body, which they didn't at all manage to make feel like was a real problem. You can see from a mile away that Twilight's going to win and then Sunset would get the crown anyway through brute force. Not that being predictable in this line of a film is a huge downside, but it's just not the most impressive feeling set piece for the finale to have. And maybe they would have had more time to cook in this film if they didn't devote so much time to the pointless romance of Twilight and Flash Sentry, who I don't hate him at all, but it really doesn't add anything to the movie. The scenes of them could have easily been written out and all that matters is that nobody would be there to prove that Twilight didn't trash the gym, which is like... I think it would have been actually a funny subversion if one of the adults just dropped, why are you so worried? This is obviously a really bad Photoshop job done by some idiot kids. And Twilight giggles nervously because that's not a thing in Equestria. Which would play into my favorite parts of this film, just seeing Twilight adapting to the world. It's actually quite charming and amusing at various points. I mean, just look at the swagger of this teenager. It's genuinely amusing at points and makes a plenty of fun moments. The lack of Equestrian magic does make the movie feel more unique, at least at the time, until the ending, Sunset Shimmer suddenly becomes this awful looking she-demon, takes over the student body and tends to take over Equestria with them, which is just kind of hard to believe. Speaking of, there's literally no indication that the pony up sequence could be possible before the ending. It just happens. Suddenly everyone gets their powers because they're super close friends now. Something that would have had a lot more impact if they actually had broken up of their own accord and strengthened their friendship by working through those rough patches instead of them being fooled by a bunch of techs and then immediately resolving it once they find out they're idiots. This is built on a friendship that is almost entirely off-screen, aside from their relationship with Twilight, which itself is still pretty weak. At least in Season 1 they came together through some hardships, here they fixed a busted gym and that's it. What a lame finale, what a lame movie! Equestria Girls is by no means the worst movie I've seen, but there's so much potential they just didn't tackle and work with, resulting in a movie that has its charming moments, but is overall incredibly blasé and unmemorable. A new power that is not the dark power? What do you... Uh, what do you mean? I really wanted to like Beyblade Fierce Battle more than I did. I hoped it'd be a real standout. But no, it's exactly the same kind of anime canon adjacent movie where everything feels like it'll have no real meaning and they add some lore that's got nothing to do with the source material that I thought it would be. That's not to say it's the worst thing ever, far from it, but it didn't leave as much of a lasting impact as I'd hoped. Now I'll admit freely, I'm more of a Metal Saga guy than an OG guy, but I still like the few bits of OG series I've managed to find time to watch. Tyson as a protagonist makes a great contrast to his later counterpart Jenga, being not an obstinate moron, but instead an obstinate asshole who can actually go five minutes without a babe battle and not want to claw his own eyes out. He's pretty much the highlight of the film, being decently entertaining across each scene he gets. Other than that, none of the side characters get to do anything, and Kai gets a disappointingly minimal amount of screen time. The villains are pretty unremarkable as well. They should be super impactful and powerful feeling, but they kind of just loiter around, blow some stuff up, and then get folded. The bay battles I can't get too upset with, this is just how they were in this period, but there really aren't many of them. We get one at the start of the movie, one Kai near the middle, and then a couple near the end, they're not very interesting. And the giant CGI monsters don't get to do as much as you might hope. It was a perfectly fine movie, but a bit of a disappointment to me. Fantastic. This was a huge waste of my time. The 2017 My Little Pony movie is absolutely gorgeous, and that's the best thing going for it. I am sorry, but as much as there is charming stuff in this movie, there's a lot that bogs it down for me. Probably the most notable thing is how unlike My Little Pony's fourth generation it is. In concept, Equestria being invaded by an outside country, forcing the main six, but not Starlight Glimmer apparently, to leave for the first time and explore the wider world is pretty great. In execution, however, some random pony with the edgiest the hedgehog design shows up and jobs three of the princesses with random magic that's never explained, which Celestia is so used to by this point that she doesn't even attempt to fight back and just accepts her fate. Then the main six go off, and their journey? It doesn't matter. 
There is no purpose to their trip, because when they get to their destination, they immediately get kicked out and don't get what they need. Instead, right after, they have their designated emotional friends breakup moment, and they go all the way back to Equestria, having accomplished nothing, and essentially just fight their way to Twilight after the villain has succeeded in his goal and kidnapped her as well. Yeah, okay, the one thing they get is they get help from the pirates they befriended and the one hippogriff that comes with them, but as it turns out, they frankly could have just probably gone to the Crystal Empire or something and bludgeoned their way through everyone. It's so frustrating, because a lot of this film feels so unimportant. Nobody learns any meaningful message, and the big breakup feels so unnatural to me. Twilight getting stroppy with her mates? Sure, I can believe that. But her going so far as to scream that maybe she'd be better off without them? That is so far beyond what I can believe for this character. Yeah, that's something they'd be pushing it if Sunset Shimmer or Rainbow Dash said it, and they're the ones who are actively abrasive and aggressive. I know they kind of make up, but they don't learn anything. They really just come together because Twilight was in danger, and they're not dumb enough to let a single fight stop them from coming to save their friend's life. There are some fun sequences here and there, like with the pirates, but a lot of the movie is just the characters walking, they say a few things to remind you of their character traits. And these are genuinely fairly complex and layered characters in the show, but they give them so little to do in this film. Pinkie Pie is wild and kooky, Rainbow Dash is a show-off who says awesome, Fluttershy might as well be from season 1. Also a lot of these designs feel off, the pirates, the villains, and the cat guy are so humanoid it's uncanny. I like the seahorses, they look fitting enough, fuck them though, Queen Bitch is useless and offers nothing. I don't even think she's in the wrong, given the fact that Twilight used her friends as a distraction so she could steal the most important relic of their kingdom, and that's a totally valid reason to throw her out. But given how easily these six ponies along with a few pirates could ransack and overrun the Storm King's entire army and get inside, makes the queen look like an utter coward. A squad of like 13 people could stop them even after he had the magic of all four alicorns. This guy was a whole discord away from being T-Rex, and he lost without any power or friendship. Speaking of the Storm King, I mean he is one of the redeeming elements of this movie. A fun and goofy villain who can genuinely be threatening? That's great! Now if only he wasn't so incompetent once he actually gets screen time. Oh, and also if he got to show up more and feel impactful. As great as the vocal performance and animation for him is, he kind of lacks impact due to minimal screen time and little to back up his hype. Tempest Shadow, for as goofy as I find her design, was at least kind of okay. She remained a decent persistent threat throughout the movie, and I can sort of believe her face turn given the Storm King turned on her, which is a first where I can believe a sudden spontaneous face turn in the franchise. Could have been a good starting point for a character arc, but she doesn't show up again. Every other character, though, just wasn't doing anything for me. It's a very cliche by the books movie that feels like it does nothing but the characters. It doesn't explore much of that wider world, at least compared to what it could have, and it has a story that feels like it goes nowhere and offers nothing. It's not without its merits, it's fun at points, and for anyone just wanting to see designs and voices of these characters on a journey singing songs, it's perfectly serviceable. And the animation in this film is spectacular. Arguably the best animated film in this entire ranking, very little is in its tier. The shading, the expressions, the bounciness, it's gorgeous. I can tell this is the kind of film that a ton of fans would love if they grew up with it. And if that's you, then please do not feel discouraged at all by my review. There is nothing wrong with loving this film if you grew up with it. And even if you didn't, you just love the show and characters. I mean, I adore the Land Before Time films, and they're not the best movies, I love them anyway. But that's what I see probably more than anything in this movie. I can see how a whole generation could love this for being the movie of that show they grew up with and adored, and that's a-okay, but I just don't think too highly of it. But with animation like this, and generally not being offensively bad, I can't even rank it that low. I mean, it's alright, like... I am led to the knowledge that of all films on this list, the most reviled one is Dragonlance Dragons of Autumn Twilight, and I am fully aware as to why that is. But frankly, I actually enjoyed my time with it. It has some major flaws, some absolutely massive ones that really do drag it down. But on the side of positives, because those aren't what anyone ever talks about, the voice acting is really solid for one. Kiva Sutherland in particular absolutely kills it as Raceland, but nobody is doing a poor job. And it's a pretty good cast considering it's direct to video nature. Fred Tatterscore, Phil Lamar, David Sobolov, they all do really good. I also just like the story being told. It's not the most complex, in fact it's really simple, but has that fun D&D people going on a journey vibe. And I found most of the characters likeable or at least interesting, which is more than can be said for several movies on this list. I was compelled enough to be interested in what was going on, and I kind of liked the sort of old VHS quality sort of feeling I got. Kind of felt like the movie you'd watch at probably a slightly too young age because your dad put it on one night after picking it up from the bargain bin, which I say with as much compliment as a sentence like that can have. The villain for as little as he showed up was also pretty threatening because he slams our heroes pretty badly. Unfortunately, there are two absolutely massive problems with this film. Just huge, genuinely. Firstly, while I'm not too against the 2D animation in this film, yeah, it's cheap, but it has personality and feels similar to, like, the Lady Death animated film. 
Uh, except this bit. This bit with the club, that's just what? The CGI, though, is some of the worst I've seen. Yeah, okay, it technically has more detail than Action Man, but that detail ends up making it look even uglier than Action Man. And the choppy, horrible animation is a real problem here. If it was all animated like this, and it was slightly less ugly and given less details, maybe I'd look past it. But the compositing with the 2D animation is absolute bottom tier. Like, worse than other Hasbro products that do the same, like Transformers Cybertron. How can a comparatively micro-budget series like Death Battle have better 3D and 2D compositing than productions made by... Toons Animation? The guys that partially did Wolverine and the X-Men? What? But the bigger problem to me is the pacing. While there are a lot of individual scenes that are good, the movie goes at a breakneck pace, with basically no time to slow down. Bits come and go, and while individually they're often solid, they come together into a film that doesn't know the value of breathing room. It can even leak into individual scenes, where characters will just spontaneously say things without any time to think or really process what each other has said, making it come across as very unnatural. This results in some scenes that could have also been pretty good feeling janky and disordered. This also feels like a lot of scenes had to be cut. It's hard to put into words, but some developments seem a bit out of nowhere or like they go nowhere. They don't get properly resolved all the time, and there is a bit of an incomplete feeling here. On a technical level, this film does not stack up to a lot of what I rank below it, and I understand all the hate it gets, but the story is just solid enough, especially in that it actually has one. And the characters I found just likable enough that my incredibly low expectations got me thoroughly surprised. On a second or third watching, I'm sure it'll go down lower without those expectations at rock bottom, but for now I can say I enjoy Dragonlance well enough. It's no standout, but it's fun enough. It's not nearly as good as Honor Among Thieves, but I imagine it's better than the original D&D live action films. I probably should check out the book it's adapting to, it's probably infinitely more better and more worth my time, more better, what? Does Taya seem kinda different to you? I hadn't noticed anything. You feeling okay, Taya? FRIENDSHIP! Oh, she seems fine, Joey. The third Equestria Girls film, Friendship Games, is a movie that, much like the first, fails to use its potential. Let's address it immediately. Psy Twy should have absolutely gone in the footsteps of Episode 1 Twilight and even Moondancer. Someone who, even as others try to be her friend, she's too engrossed in her work and her interest to care. Not only would this apply a super unique side of the character to the film, it also contrasts better with Sunset Shimmer. Because the whole film is meant to build up the contrast between the two. The idea of them swapping places, Sunset has to use what she's learned in the last two movies to do what Twilight did for her. But it just doesn't work as well. Because Sai Twi is kinda just normal Twilight, but a bit more socially awkward and completely useless. Which I feel is the opposite of how it should have been, to facilitate a more thematic and interesting story. Sure, the final fight looks great, but the message doesn't feel as strong when it's like, not a good thematic contrast. And despite its predecessor Rainbow Rocks having multiple good lessons about friendship, this one defaults to just friendship is awesome, beam struggle, how interesting. And Sai Twice sudden villain turn does feel a bit out of place, as if she was meant to have been kind of antagonistic the whole time, but they changed that last minute. I think just having her act differently and learn about friendship and shit would have been cool. And speaking of underutilized characters, the intro this film had had me so excited to see that the now established human versions of the main six would be seemingly going up against rivals. But no. The Shadow Whatevers end up being almost entirely characterless entities. Aside from one scene where they interact with their counterparts, they never do anything. They are not counterparts to the main six, they are only advertised as such. Then there's the main villain, Principal Cinch. Should have been a human version of King Sombra, I mean, I'm just gonna be honest. Not only do I think that would have been called fan service and fit with Dean Cadence and the Crystal Empire and all that, I think if they would have written a more personal reason for the rivalry with Celestia and her school, I would have had more reason to care. Don't need to make the villain sympathetic, just a more personal element, so I'm not thinking, this entire world-threatening event was done because some old bitch wanted to keep her school's reputation up. Which is just lame. At least Sunset Shimmer in the first film had the motivation of wanting to conquer all of Equestria. Nothing special, but at least it's a motivation that I could see driving someone to bring this power together. And man, I could have sworn that Vinyl Scratch joined the squad at the end of the last movie, but she's almost entirely absent in this one. You know, actually making her a main character would have added an extra element to differentiate this group from the normal versions. Not only do they have Sunset Shimmer instead of Twilight Sparkle, they also then just get a Twilight Sparkle of their own anyway, and Vinyl Scratch is not there. So many things could have been done to spice it up, but it's really how little they do with Saitwai that brings the movie down. She straight up just runs around pulling the power from the girls, and it seems none of them mention to the others, yeah, so I ponied up and then she showed up and a thing that she had sucked the magic out of me. Which once it happens directly in front of Pinkie Pie, the second one feels like that should have been the last time, but no. And like, what is this device? Is this ever explained? No. It is literally a plot device. I was excited to see Twilight as an antagonist, honestly. A normally very smart character who's super organized and knows all the details on the heroes feels like it would have made for an interesting villain. 
with her folly probably being that she doesn't understand friendship, so she doesn't really know the heroes as well as she thinks, and they do things she doesn't predict because of it. Look at how simple it was to come up with that. That said, while I think it has more outright negatives in the first film, like the villains not even having any characterization and the characters having even less personality overall compared to the first one, and honestly even worse pacing and less to do with the setting in terms of fun things, it does also have more outright positives in the first one. Because at least unlike the first one, it fucking attempted something, and of course Sunset Shimmer is way better here. I'm still not sold on all they tried with her, but I'm glad they left out the original intended characterization of being homesick. I think that would have spat in the face of her newly formed friendship if all she was thinking about was how to ditch them. Maybe it was just her really wanting to see Celestia again, but to see being too nervous to, and after redeeming Twilight, realizing how far she's come, and maybe Celestia would forgive her too, that could have led to something, but hey, I love Sunset, and she's generally pretty good in this movie. Being a more overly aggressive character without being outright arrogant and as impulsive as Rainbow Dash makes her more unique among the group, and I genuinely feel like she's the kind of person to scream at someone who didn't mean anything wrong and then immediately regret it when she calms down. And hey, while this film's bullshit dumbass ending is still a bullshit dumbass laser beam final boss, not only does it look better than the first film, but it doesn't pull anything out of its ass to do so, and it even manages to have something characterful to it. I'm also glad they didn't have normal Twilight show up until the end for a joke, leaving Sunset on her own to deal with her counterpart and letting that lead into her frustrations on not having Twilight to rely on and projecting her onto Saito it makes for a more interesting story than if they just relied on Twilight again. Plus, that ending bit is the funniest joke in the movie. Also, where the fuck was Trixie? Looking over, I am worried that people might think I outright dislike this film. It's really not like that. I do like the movie and what it was going for. I just think with a little more time in the oven and maybe another 5 or 10 minutes overall, and a redistribution of time across the different plot points, would have, would have done a lot to make this really excel. Maybe even make it the best of the Equestria Girl films. But as it is, it's just solid. Is that Santa on the roof? Well, if not, I got a present for him. There's really only one thing that separates a very minty Christmas from the rest of G3 in quality. That's that I really like Minty, I don't know why. The whole special wanted to give her the biggest hug. She's an absolute failure at everything that she tries to do, but she really just wants to help everyone. It makes her very charming, and I really did want to see her succeed. And overall, I think that describes the entire film, honestly. It's really charming, and I wanted everything to go well. Unlike Princess Promenade, which really doesn't have anything going on, this one at least has a major plot point that needs to be resolved. Minty fucks up a giant candy cane that is on top of a tree. That required a lot less context in my head. Then they go to the North Pole to get Santa, but Santa isn't there and leaves them a note. Dear pesky plumbers, the Cooper- And then they're all friends and it lights up some socks and Santa shows up. The sock thing is really silly and hard to take seriously, but it does lead to the obvious but kind of satisfying bit of Santa turning the sock idea Minty had into stockings to be used everywhere. It's kind of formulaic and the magic of friendship is not a thing established in this world, so when it just comes out of nowhere it's a bit of an ass pull. And I do think it's a bit annoying how everyone has to kind of ignore Minty in distress for the sake of the plot, but the problems really don't outweigh the positives here, and there's really not much of either. It's a fine film with little going on. I also like how G3 Rainbow Dash is just straight up G4 rarity. For as simple as it is, I think Minty Christmas captures the charm of a traditional Christmas special well enough. It's a fun time worth watching, but probably not something I'll revisit too often. Our civilization was destroyed by people turning into furries. Ah. <clears throat> what? Does G.I. Joe Valor vs. Venom deserve to be this high? No, not at all, but by god, it is everything I could have ever wanted from a Spy Troop sequel and more. Everything about this movie is a level of bad that wraps back around to being god tier. Now, that's not to say it's all bad, there is some unironically good stuff. There is some manner of character growth for the character of Kamakura, the fun paintball fight at the start is a charming little bit and does set up the hilarity of them using paintball guns in the final battle. The villains are relatively effective at a few points, these two who are absolutely gay as well. And not only are they relatively effective, the villains are also genuinely funny as intended. Cobra Commander has so many funny lines just because of the delivery of them, and Scott McNeil kills it as Destro again. All the villains are just entertaining as hell, and the Joes are pretty fun too, just not as much. There's plenty of hilarious off-the-wall moments. I mean, the main villain's plan is to fire missiles through a railgun that will cause a rain of venom that will turn Earth's population into furries that he can mind control into his slaves. That's just... that's just so goddamn stupid! I lost it when he sent the K-9 Brigade to yiff the Joes in the Antarctic. I can't even, like, I can't even process how stupid a lot of this movie is, but it's just brilliant. 77 minutes of the most mind-numbingly pointless, inane bullshit but it's so worth it for arguably one of the most fun movies in this entire ranking. I'm allowed to enjoy some trash every now and again, and this is some grade A trash. Do you want to see a ninja cut a plane's wing off with a magical sword? Do you want to see someone do the whole, you're alive to send a message trope, only for the person he wants to send the message to to magically appear behind him? 
Do you want to see the people electrocute fishmen using the rubber part of an electrical wire? This is absolute popcorn rubbish, and it's great at that. Overkill's gone mad! Well, at least he isn't boring! This day one shall stand and one shall fall. Why throw away your life so recklessly? Your mama's so fat it looks like she's smuggling energon cubes under her chassis. What? Though technically this segment is for the Beast Wars special Super Lifeform Transformers special, across all the movies for Beast Wars, there's only one 47 minute segment of the original animation, Lyo Convoy in Imminent Danger. And that's all we'll be looking at today. There's a lot of bias rising it up here, because it's not really much of a story, and it either doesn't make sense if you haven't watched the show because who are these characters? Or it doesn't make sense if you have watched the show because it doesn't really fit into the timeline at all and has some continuity problems. But as a fun little story where a time portal is found and brings out an original character big monster thing, so the Cybertron summoned forth Convoy from the Beast Wars cartoon, the Japanese dub of it at least, yeah, where there are a few scenes where it's just cool for the novelty of it or genuinely heartwarming because one of the greatest heroes of the Transformers race supporting everyone and they kick ass. I think it's fine. It's a simple prompt. Make two generations of Beast Wars crossover, which is given full fan service mode with the fucking Super Saiyan power-ups they get. But for as simple as it is, I'd highly say it does much wrong. In the context of being just a special to make fans happy amidst a bunch of repeated episodes, I give it four points. And the credits? Adorable how it's just made up of drawings submitted by young fans of the series. It's heartwarmingly cute, it makes me happy. Yeah. G.I. Joe the movie is amazing, for about the first 30 minutes or so. That's not to say it's overall bad, but the opening act really feels like it belongs to a better movie. Not only is this opening action sequence great and backed by a banger track, it, le it leads into like an actually decently set up storyline that felt like it was going somewhere really cool. And then it just stops. It's almost amazing how quickly the film derails after a great first like 30 minutes. Suddenly we have a bunch of new characters introduced midway through the movie and a big deal is made about them. And there's an attack after some pointless training scenes and we learn a big reveal the new guy Falcon's connected to Duke. And then suddenly we go to our new villains who then just drop their entire backstory which not only kind of just comes out of nowhere and gives us the origin of Cobra Commander. And also the big leader of the villain hates humanity's inorganic technologies and that's why he wants to steal one of our inorganic technologies to use it to destroy us by using it to power some of his organic technology. What? You're really gonna act like your stuff is superior to humanity's when you literally cannot do your big plan with your own? Fuck out of here, bruh. You had thousands of more years to develop your tech and it's still worse than mankind's. I think what really lowers this film for me is that sudden drop in the middle. Because the ending is kind of fine, if a bit rushed and awkward in a lot of places. The plot of this movie goes from progressing from point A to point B to randomly turning into one of those and then this happened movies. I will give credit to the fact that the villains are actually threatening and accomplish things. They come really close to winning in fact. Though if Yo-Jo and Cobra weren't pulling off any badass moments as catchphrases, then Serpentor's Cobra la 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 absolutely wasn't. I don't know man, what do I say? The main problem with this movie is that it has a billion subplots coming out of nowhere and basically all being undercooked. This guy Falcon is our de facto protagonist I guess and he doesn't show up until midway through the movie. We don't see his development on screen at all and the original protagonist Duke sacrifices himself for him. Which itself you can tell was hastily rewritten at the last moment to just be a coma. What with how we don't see him again after what very much comes off as a morning scene. And his survival amounts to an out of nowhere radio call at the end going, Ah, uh, by the way, Duke woke up from his coma. And then after that, we get a somber, Thanks, brother, from Falcon. Huh? I think the biggest missed opportunity in this movie is Cobra Commander. I would have loved to see him actually, like, find a way to recover and stay with G.I. Joe. That would have made for a really cool-ass plot development. As it feels like this movie accomplishes nothing to the wider world beyond introducing some characters and getting rid of Cobra Commander and nothing else. Nothing revealed in the movie feels like it matters. Why is it ranked high then? It's fun. These action scenes are wholly unmemorable and lack any standout moments, but they're fun in the moment, just seeing the chaos unfold. The billion subplots while making the story a bit shite do succeed in making the conflict feel bigger than it is, and the animation does tend to be amongst the best that Hasbro's put out. There are some gorgeous shots and great action animation, and the reflectiveness of Cobra Commander's mask has never been sold better than this. It's also surprisingly brutal. There's a lot more blood than you'd expect, and that's pretty great. And yeah, as I said, competent villains, a great first act, and a fun vibe overall, they're all small things that make me smile and come together to put it above quite a few other films. It's no masterpiece, but it's pretty fun. It makes it clear to me that the My Little Pony film of Hasbro's original trilogy is the odd one out in terms of being crap. Oh, I've wasted my life. I feel like it's going to piss off a lot of people that I've placed the fifth generation My Little Pony film this high. And fair enough, because there are definitely a whole lot of issues I have with it. Especially as a continuation of Friendship is Magic. But even with those issues, this is a perfectly fun little adventure movie that's definitely worth checking out. To get it out of the way, yeah, I don't really like this as a sequel to Gen 4. 
The way in which all the pony groups are at each other's throats again after the main six did so much, not only to fix pony relationship with other species, but also one another. Literally right before the finale of Friendship is Magic, a big deal is made about villains turning ponies against each other, but then the rippling teachings of the main six, influencing their protégés and all their friends, was enough to unify everyone again. They vanquish not only the villains, but even the Windigos that represent the very idea of them being against one another. Now that amazing moment of unity feels a lot darker in hindsight, considering Twilight actually wasn't really nearly as good as influencing those who would come after as we thought. Once she's gone, everyone's racist again. It's a really dour way to continue the timeline and kind of makes all the work put into previous series kind of feel meaningless. That said, as its own thing, I do think the movie is funny enough. Sunny Star Scout is a pretty fun protagonist, and while I don't find her as charmingly dorky as Twilight Sparkle, I still find her enjoyable. Her genuine desire to help and do good is incredibly likable, and I did want to see her succeed. I can't say I was as connected to most of the supporting cast, but I did like them to some extent. Izzy is likably hyperactive and Zip was pretty cool. I definitely feel like Hitch Trailblazer and especially Pip Petals are undercooked though. While not bad, Hitch's arc from distrusting other races of ponies to being on board with friendship is really spontaneous and gets one scene, but given he's a decent guy, I can kinda see it to some extent. Pip, however, really felt like she needed a scene dedicated to her entire way of life and place in her land being destroyed and having to travel with the people who directly caused it, solely because she needs to hold on to the hope that it was worth it. Something to really make her hit emotionally, but nah. As for other characters, I didn't really feel myself attached to many. I didn't like Sunny's dad, he was charming in the few bits we got to see of him, and the main villain of Sprout Cloverleaf was... fine? I don't know, he was just fine to me. I didn't care much for him and I didn't find him that impressive. Terminator Pony was more compelling, that's my favourite joke in the movie. Which is not to say that the movie is unfunny, I did find the film had a surprising amount of jokes and wordplay that I enjoyed. Jokes were overall solid, and I thought the story, while extremely formulaic, was good enough for what it was trying to be. It's a simple, dumb, fun film, and while I prefer the animation of the 2017 movie, I actually found myself charmed by this film's animation. I really didn't like it going in, but it grew on me. Even if a movie animated entirely like the opening would have fucked. This film does lack any good action, and the ending is pretty obviously going exactly how you think. Oh my god, there's a big hole in the MacGuffin and we only have pieces matching two of the three pony species. I wonder if it needs- OH IT NEEDS A THIRD PIECE YOU DON'T SAY! Which is not something figured out because Sunny is smart. No, it's because she puts the thing that has the needed piece in just coincidentally the perfect place to shine a light to get her attention. Then when it doesn't work, what's their solution? Alright, oh the magic of friendship. Seriously, there's one film in this entire franchise that requires them to do something with the power of friendship instead of just activate it to win. That's wild. As an introduction to a new generation of My Little Pony, I think it's fine. Yes, I would prefer the story went a different way, which definitely isn't to say that an anti-discrimination plot is a problem or anything, that it just doesn't fit a post-G4 timeline. But for what it is, beyond that problem, it's a good movie. It has one of the best flowing, most cohesive, and solid scripts across the entirety of My Little Pony's film lineup, and solidly ranks as one of my favorite films in that franchise. Not enough gay ponies to me though, roller coaster of friendship keeps winning. The most powerful thing in the world is friendship. Legends of Everfree is the fourth and final Equestria Girls film, and it's a fairly decent way to go out. Far from perfect, but I actually really like the core of this movie. Primarily, the film is about Saitwai overcoming her lingering worries and concerns with her past. Not anything new, we've seen at least three ponies go through the same thing, all of which directly connected to Twilight, and one of which being Saitwai's best friend. But I like how it was handled here. It genuinely felt at points like two friends just trying to communicate with each other over something and not knowing how to go about it. The lesson of not letting your past mistakes and problems hold you back from seeing the good new things in your life is a pretty good one. Sunset doesn't have a lot to do in this movie, which is a shame because I like seeing her in general, but the way she fucking sleep fights when she jumps awake is the cutest thing ever. I love her. But the girls also get superpowers. Yeah, okay. I don't hate how it was handled, but it does feel like a weird genre shift and feels like it kind of brings everyone closer to their pony versions, especially with Twilight inexplicably being the strongest one of them. I do kind of wish they had different powers to their normal counterparts, the way Rarity and Pinkie Pie do. Like, maybe instead of Rainbow Dash having super speed, what if she just had automatic super reflexes or something? It's not awful or anything, but it does suck away a tiny bit of identity that the Equestria Girls part of the franchise had, separated from the normal franchise. All said though, I do like the powers, because they do directly tie into Saitwai's character arc and how she develops over the course of the film. She also has a better written romantic subplot. Not perfect, oh god no, because it still ends up having almost nothing to do with an actual narrative, and that's kind of lame. But at least there is some chemistry compared to Flash Sentry. Like, they actually talk and have common interests and banter, it's kind of cute. Even if the fact that he's an authority figure and she's a student is incredibly uncomfortable despite their canonically close ages. Timber otherwise is kind of whatever, he's nothing special as a character and the red herring was pretty obvious. Gloriosa meanwhile, I'm not sure what they were doing with her. 
Not that she's bad, I do find her funny at points, but the whole plot hinges on Filthy Rich, who appears in three scenes and is our designated villain, who wants to replace the cat with a spa, and we're supposed to see him as a bad guy, but he owns the land, Gloriosa has not paid him rent, and he still agreed to let her have another month to get her payment in, despite not needing to. Gloriosa, meanwhile, transforms into a literal black-eyed Susan, I see what they did there, and terrorizes everyone, fucking with the wildlife and potentially severely injuring or traumatizing children. She's the good guy of the two? At least her villain song kinda bangs. It's no dazzling song, but it's pretty damn good. And, you know, I like a bit of wordplay, the spin on the camp name of Everfree on the lyrics, so... She's saying we're doing it for Camp Everfree, and also she's doing it so the camp is forever free. I mean, that's just clever writing, I like it. And the final battle this time at least has some cool action stuff before the boring anti-climax. I mean, this does continue the previous two films' trends of having an emotional climax, and this is incredibly sappy. They're usually kinda sappy, but Saitwai's declaration of I am Twilight Sparkle and this is the power of friendship! That is so corny. But I also do like all the other girls coming into her mind through Sunset's empathy powers and motivating her to overcome her problems. That was nice. I think if they got rid of her line about the power of friendship, children would still be able to understand what the scene means. And then there's a big magical fart and Gloriosa is beaten. Wonderful. A perfectly fine film with some great action scenes. A lot of fun moments I'm sure fans would love, and a decent overarching character arc for the character who I thought was most lacking in that. In fact, the more I look at this ranking, the more I realize that without Saitwai's arc, this film would not be above the likes of New Generation. These films are really close to me, and while I think in almost every way New Generation is better, I like Saitwai's arc enough to push Legends of Ever 3 just slightly above. Huh. Um, Optimus, you want to see something funny? No. Lately, there has been a growing trend of people coming out and hating on Prime, thinking that that makes them cool. And to be clear, this is not the same as people who just don't think Prime is a good show, this is people who go out of their way to attack others for liking it. And to that I say, shut up, I still love Transformers Prime. It's not my favourite Transformers show, I think in reflection I put Animated and Beast Wars above it overall, but it's still in my top three. And Predacons Rising is a fantastic finale to the series. Not perfect, but no film is, and it definitely could have benefited from a few extra minutes. Honestly, even just an extra 10 minutes might be all that it would have required to jump up an extra spot. Jumping right in, Predacons Rising is immediately notable for being arguably the best 3D animated film on this list. It's between this and A New Generation as the only ones that look even in the realm of good, and it's probably preference as to which one might consider better. Looking good, having great sound design, and having fantastic voice acting are all hallmarks of Transformers Prime in general, as is having a pretty decent story. Now as a story on its own, it's arguably not the greatest, because it's mostly just a follow-on from the show, but it is a film designed to be watched as such, and so it's probably fair to judge it as such. And the story, while simple, is effective at having high stakes and being interesting. Unicron is back in a Super Megatron body, and everyone is juggling that problem with trying to figure out what's up with the two new Predacons, and trying to keep the planet going while Prime is absent in the depths of space looking for the Allspark. While not every character has something to do, they are all still as likeable as they were in the show, and it's hard for me not to just enjoy the events because I already like these characters. This is also the only lengthy period of time we get to spend with Prime Bumblebee when he can speak, at least until R.I.D. 2015 where he's pretty much a different character. This film also has some of the best action sequences and set pieces on the list. A battle between giant robot dragons, those same dragons blasting at a flood of undead dragons, Unicron Megatron just absolutely dominating everyone as they scramble to survive. It's all really well animated and entertaining, making good use of the strengths of each involved character. I wouldn't say it has the best fights in the Prime series, but it has some bangers, especially compared to what's on this list. But what the film arguably does best is being the finale it is. Almost everything comes together for a satisfying conclusion to this era of Transformers. Bumblebee finally gets to be a warrior now that the war is over. Predaking finally gets to have a glimmer of hope for the future of his species. Knockout gets to dump his second boyfriend and finally find a place where he can probably be happy again. And Prime. My god. Optimus Prime in this part of the franchise is often criticized for being boring, and I totally get it. To quickly go into the show itself, I always like the idea of him being this guy who we see when he reverts to Orion used to be kind of just normal. A charming, nice fellow who has now turned into this perpetually serious, fun-avoiding man, putting on all the responsibilities and stress onto himself for the sake of others, never letting himself have the freedom that he wished for all other sentient beings. So we come to the ending of this film, seeing Prime in one of the few times he ever smiles in the series as the last things his Autobots will ever see of their leader, flying into the well of all sparks in that moment where he closes his eyes and is finally free from the strain, pain and stress of war and battle. Now he can have that freedom for himself, giving his life as a hero for the sake of his planet. It's so good! As the well explodes with life, the Prime theme swelling on the sight, 
it is one of the best finales any Transformers series has ever had. Everything in this movie does what it can to give us closure. RC no longer has to go into war she doesn't want to. Bumblebee comes into his own as a hero and a leader. Ratchet finally gets to see the world he loves restored to health. Knockout is now an Autobot, no longer stuck as a Decepticon. Smokescreen doesn't have any hangups anymore, but when he was almost a prime. Predakin gets to fucking kill Starscream, I don't care what RA2015 said. Of course, as I said, there are problems. Ultra Magnus is pretty much absent the entire movie after getting his ass kicked. They bring Ratchet in to take care of him, but he doesn't even get fixed up in time to contribute at the end, which is really disappointing. And while Ratchet comes back, they didn't bring back or even mention any of the main humans, which I know some people would like, but as someone who likes pretty much the entire Prime cast, I can't help but be disappointed. Shockwave is really weird here. He's there, and then he gets swarmed by zombie cons, and then we see him later inexplicably a bit injured but otherwise fine, and then he's gone, never addressed. And frankly, while Megatron Unicron's voice is fine, I'm not too big on the Unicron voice in the series, so he only sometimes sounds good. While making for a good finale, it definitely could have used another 10 minutes. And that's a shame, because what they did manage to pack in, I think they did really well, and I think the movie gets way too much crap. Partially, that's just because the name is a bit dumb, though. Yeah, the undead Predacons rised, but in terms of actual Predacons, we only got Darksteel and Skylinks, and they're... I mean, they're fine, they have a pretty sick fight with Predaking, but let's just say they ain't Predaking. Again, some more time would have been a real benefit for this movie, but as it is, it has some of the best action on the list, some of the best animation, one of the most likable casts, and honestly, some of the better jokes, I like quite a few of them. Bumblebee gaslighting with the Immobilizer twice, only for that to end up kind of backfiring on him is pretty great. A great finale, and one of the best films Hasbro has animated. She is such a bad bitch though! I will fuck the shit out of that- My Little Pony Equestria Girl's Rainbow Rocks is kind of a miracle of a film. Given how every other film in this franchise is, the way in which this one excels is truly astounding. Literally everything I wish was in the first film is in here. I think just off the top, the plot is a lot tighter. A setup as simple as three monsters from Equestria with music-based powers are plotting to drain the magic from our heroes, leading them to develop a musical counterspell that they eventually pull off, isn't the most complex, but it actually has a sense of tension to it. The villains have actual weight to them because their plan is exclusively dangerous to Earth, which we come to care about because, well, we actually get reasons to like our heroes and their world. And the Battle of the Bands is a lot more dynamic of a setup than a glorified political election at a high school. And the villains themselves have so much more over Sunset Shimmer in the first film and Principal Cinch in the third and whatnot. The Dazzlers are not only genuinely threatening, but deliciously entertaining. Adagio just, mm, what a bitch. But not ironically, she, Arya, and Sonata make a great villainous trio, with Adagio pulling off a deliciously evil and sinister boss who has the whole school wrapped around her finger with a plan that actually ends up working until the last second when the hero is able to pull off their counterspell, which is the one thing Adagio didn't know they had up their sleeve. Along with her, Arya is hilariously dry and complains about everything, relatable, and Sonata is just dopey and silly and never knows anything, even more relatable. Not only are they fun to watch bounce off each other, but it's also fun to see them bounce off others as well. What an amazing trio of beautifully evil villains, with some amazing villain songs. Battle, Under Our Spell, and Welcome to the Show are my favorite songs in the movie, and they're all sung by the Dazzlers. Battle is a hilarious but bang subversion of the Get Together song from the first film, Under Our Spell Genuinely Fucks, and Welcome to the Show is the song to the amazing climax. The climax in which all the character arcs come together, and basically everyone has some sort of character arc with some kind of lesson. Rarity teaches us that just because you want to make a contribution to a project, you shouldn't just go on and on about it, otherwise people are going to think you're only in it for yourself. To play off that, Applejack teaches us not to trivialize what your friends value just because it doesn't seem important to you. Fluttershy comes together with Rainbow Dash to tell us about making a project all about yourself. Just because you came up with an organized project doesn't mean it's your project. Everyone works together and everyone has to make a contribution. When you make everything about yourself and don't let others shine, you'll only make the overall project worse. A friendship is an equal balance between everyone, not a way to make you look better. I know Rainbow Dash being such an asshole might turn people off the film, but this actually fits in line with a Rainbow Dash who didn't go through with any of the major character arcs from the show, and spent a lot of her time friendless. This is an important lesson for this version of the character to learn. Pinkie Pie really just represents what she normally does, mind you. It's important to have fun in a project. But if all you do is try to have fun and don't take things seriously, then you can ruin it for others. It's simple, it works, but she's actually kind of likable in this movie. But the real focus is, of course, on Twilight Sparkle and Sunset Shimmer. While every arc is prevalent throughout the film, both for jokes until it comes around at the end, and in serious moments that highlight how Fluttershy isn't listened to, Rarity's values get ignored, and Applejack focuses too much on getting the job done and not enjoying herself, Remo Dash makes everything about her and Pinkie Pie goofs off, Twilight and Sunset are fittingly in the background of a lot of this. Twilight's arc is all about how you shouldn't put all the weight on the shoulders of one friend who knows what they're doing. 
Just because someone is good at something doesn't mean they might not ever need help or that you should push unreasonable expectations on them and treat them like they're perfect and won't ever fail. Otherwise, you run the risk of pulling them in the exact spot as Twilight, crushed under the weight of expectation and the need to live up to the image your friends have given to you. The way in which she's actively just scribbling around trying to figure out the counterspell and not noticing the problems everyone has because she's too engrossed may just be small moments, but they build up to make everything fit together. And of course, Sunset Shimmer, the biggest reason I love this film, and this film is the reason I have come to genuinely love the character. To me, Shimmer's story read to me as someone who feels uncomfortable really getting into the same things as a group she's just recently joined. Someone who is happy with her friends, but doesn't feel like it's her place to really speak up or join in on their activities. Constantly in the back, and we see her react as Twilight is suddenly brought into the band when nobody ever asked her if she wanted to join, and she's too awkward to ask herself. She's crushed by the weight of thinking that everyone expects her to mess something up, like that she has to walk on eggshells around everyone because she can't get past her own guilt and see that others have already forgiven her. She is the one person who noticed the real problems the whole time. She was able to see them, but she didn't feel comfortable pointing them out because she was so new. I think if this movie was around and I had watched it when I was younger, her story would have honestly resonated a lot with me. The feeling of being happy with a group, but not feeling like you fit in and not being comfortable talking because you just don't think it's your place. And of course, it culminates into the lesson that you shouldn't let a problem fester, but address it before it grows too big for words. I love Sunset to no end, and the satisfaction of finally seeing her join in with the group in the final song and obtain her own pony form and contribute to the rainbow just hits so hard, especially because it gives us the former villain against the current villains, which is always fun. And the way she floats up during the final song, it's just satisfying when you realize what's going on. And what a climax! They finally work through their problems and grow closer as friends. They have an actual singing battle. The Dazzlers straight up summon their original forms as astral projections and actually defeat our heroes until they fill in the last gap in their spell with Sunset, leaving them together to summon a giant space alicorn to win. Which thematically matches, the Dazzlers may be a team, but they're not friends, so they're not united in this way. They have three individual separate projections, while the protagonists have one united one. And yeah, they don't just win because friendship is based, but rather their stronger and growing friendship allow them to play their song together. With Rarity's costumes, Fluttershy's song, Rainbow Dash no longer taking the spotlight, Applejack no longer complaining, Pinkie Pie having fun and not distracting anyone, Twilight not worrying, and Sunset actually joining in, friendship facilitates them getting stronger to do something to win, instead of just being the death beam of friendship, and that's great. I can't stop, I love this movie. This is honestly my favorite thing in the entire My Little Pony franchise, it's amazing. That's not to say the movie's perfect. The romance with Flash Sentry is even more hilariously undercooked than the first film. In fact, his entire subplot of that wanting to be in the Battle of the Bands and mad that Twilight was against him kind of feels unnecessary. It's like he's tacked on because they were shackled by what they wrote in the first film. And Vinyl Scratch appearing at the end to help out is kind of an arse pull. It's not as big an arse pull as the first film's magic powers because you can see her in some scenes not being affected by the Dazzler's magic, which foreshadows her being the only non-possessed person, so... Yeah, okay, sure, but she kind of just shows up after having no role and saves the day. More could have been done there. But despite that, I mean, I love this film, and I, I, even, I haven't even mentioned Trixie. Trixie is fine in the actual show, at least in the episodes she appeared in before the film, she got better afterwards, but I adore her in this movie, an amazing foil who isn't really much of a character but is a hilarious antagonistic force, arrogant, funny, and actually kind of good at what she does. I love her, she's the best. And man, the animation glow up. Look at the animation with the Dazzler songs, what the fuck, this goes so hard. And the transformation, it, the lighting scene at Pinkie Pie's house, like this is so much better than the first movie. And the fan service is at its greatest, like all G4 My Little Pony. Background characters that fans have come to love get to show up and make cameos like Octavia, Bulk Biceps, Derpy, and Vinyl Scratch most notably. And it all ends with a credit sequence that gives us the satisfying sequences of Sunset Shimmer finally being accepted by her classmates, which warms my heart, culminating in the best stinger in any of these films period with the reveal of this world's version of Twilight Sparkle. I love this movie and how it came out. Also, you ever notice how Vinyl Scratch looks like a Papa Louis character? Everyone has those films they love that they know really aren't that great. The movies that you love in spite of the flaws and not because they lack them. For me, that will always be the Transformers the movie. This movie's history is so weird. First it was reviled, then it came back and was adored, and now it almost seems like people are trying to come up and hate it again. But I can never do that. I love this movie, both for what it genuinely does right and because of my own personal bias. This is my childhood movie, and I loved it then and I still love it now. On a technical level, it's hard to ignore this movie is arguably the best animated film on this ranking. Again, there's only really a few things in its level, but it also has my favourite soundtrack of any film. Not only is the touch as banging as everyone says, 
but dare, nothing's gonna stand in our way, hunger, instruments of destruction, it's just full of banger after banger after banger. Those are the embellishments though, I genuinely love the story and characters in this movie. Now, yeah, it definitely did need to begin with so much pointless death, and the scene of the Decepticons taking over the shuttle is a bit silly with how easily everyone dies other than Ironhide, but the opening action sequence is absolutely insane. Seeing all these characters come together into a huge brawl that feels more like a war than we've ever seen partially helped because of the deaths that go on. Devastator's a proper menace, Blitzwing's cool to see as always, Spring against the funny line, and there's the iconic battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron at the end of it, the best fight they've ever had across all media. It's not the one that has the highest scale or the most epic moments, but it's the most visceral and intense. And it ends with them mutually taking each other out. We can't avoid talking about the death of Optimus Prime. This is the scene that really turned Optimus into a legend, because this scene is what made people realize just how important Optimus Prime really was. It's emotional and tragic and oh so well animated, and Megatron's death is differently impactful because it's Starscream finally getting what he always wanted. And this leads us to meet the new cast, and the cast is great. Hot Rod gets a lot of shit, but I like him. Cup and Blur are both likeable, Springer is great, RC finally gives us a main player female character, Ultra Magnus is a total badass, and while the new Decepticons aren't much, Galvatron at least gets to be a proper menace, and Rekkar is lovable, he's not a Decepticon though, I don't know why I put him after. Then there's the villain. I've said before that I have three types of favorite villains. Ones with relatable or understandable motivations that you can see the perspective of even if you don't agree with them. Ones that are silly, goofy and fun but that the flick of a switch can turn genuinely threatening and terrifying. And the ones like this film's main antagonist. Forces of entropy beyond any comprehension of mankind. Entities on such a scale and power as to be beyond what a human could ever perceive. Things that can barely be called characters because the call on that would be to lower them to the standards of reality that we exist on. They are less like an evil dictator and more like a human tearing up the pages of a book. Scarcely considered evil, because in comparison to them we could scarcely be considered real. Transformers the movie would introduce the overarching antagonist of the entire franchise, Unicron. He has been many things across the franchise history, a being that can't be killed so long as concept exists, a monster that cannot wake up without destroying Earth, a being on such a scale that multiversal protectors transcended to higher dimensions barely are acknowledged as existing by him, but none of them have ever had the sheer presence he has in this movie. The opening of this movie establishes Unicron as nothing short of unstoppable. We see a nice and lovely planet, Lithone, inhabitants talking, scientists conferring, children playing around, and in only a few minutes it's all gone. Yes, this film did not even attempt to hide the fact that a world full of life and full of children was just snuffed out, and nobody noticed. This thing, this planet-sized thing consumes entire worlds for sustenance, and nothing the planet attempted could stop it. As the film goes on, he's this untouchable threat. He humbles the main villain of the series up to that point in a single action. He survives a moon exploding inside of him without a scratch. He only seems concerned with one small artifact that nobody can even open no matter how hard they try. And then when all hope seems lost, when there's nothing left, it still gets worse. Unicron's transformation in this movie is one of the most iconic scenes in the entire franchise. It is a legendary sequence, not just for how gorgeous the animation is, with the detail of the parts moving and the reveal of his lighting up torso, and at last the rising shot of his body, but for the impact it had at the time. Sure, nowadays we all know that Unicron is a planet transformer, and it was probably even kind of an obvious reveal back then. But as a child, watching this for the first time, this moment is something else. We had never seen anything approaching this scale in the franchise. And suddenly this entire planet has turned into a robot and is smashing his hand to the surface of Cybertron to a level we'd never witnessed before. The entire Decepticon army won the Autobots the whole series had only been fighting and struggling against as a small squadron back on Earth get annihilated by Unicron. They barely scratch him and even as the Autobots crash into him and destroy each of his eyes, he's barely inconvenienced. It's only when the Matrix is finally opened that Unicron is defeated and the words light our darkest hour finally take meaning. Unicron is the most impactful villain Hasbro has ever made, and half that impact comes from this movie alone. The journey to find out more about this thing and to get somewhere and figure out what to do and just escape the Galvatron guy who's killing everyone is so fun. It's fun and the heroes always feel on the back foot, but never like it's hopeless. This movie has some classic action scenes, even outside of the opening half an hour. Hot Rod and Cup tearing up the Sharktacons and Grimlock showing up, the Autobots and Junkion racing battle, everyone firing on Unicron and just trying to do anything and know it's sick. I love this film, and I always will. It embodies more than anything that this tier list isn't really like any other. These films aren't childhood films the same way that Disney or Pixar or DreamWorks movies are. They're childhood films connected to shows and toy lines. 
Those who grew up with these films, grew up with these characters, tangible figures of these characters and shows about their stories that went on for potentially years before the movie happened. So if I rank the film you love near the bottom, even if I really railed on it, don't be too discouraged, it's all in good fun. And I have to exaggerate a little for comedic value if people want to actually be entertained. There's no shame in loving these films, and that's that.